the record button. Welcome to MED 120. This is medical terminology. I am your professor for this class. My name is uh, Dr. Nelson Garayas. And um, at 6.30, uh, we're going to have a guest lecturer. It'll be uh, Miss um, Laura De Leon, our librarian. And um, she'll be talking about <clears throat> this week and next week, very, two very important things uh, that um, that are important not only for your education, but for the university is APA format and, um, and also plagiarism, okay? Um, because it's, um, it's, 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 it's a problem in academia. Uh, we don't have that big of a problem because we have these little mini lectures and we're gonna be talking about uh, right now about the things that you need to know uh, for every week. So if this is your Moodle course shell and MED 120 is the name of the class. And if you'll see here, um, it's for NAX. Four is the code for Monday, N is for evenings and AX, it's out of the Alexandria campus. It is, as you could see here, there are 10 modules, it's 10 weeks. For, so every week, so the best way to look at it is, is every week is 10%. Week five and 10, Week five is a midterm and uh, week 10 is a midterm. Um, there's also some work there uh, during those weeks, but I'll tell you specifically which one. So if you click on module one and you click on every week, what's due every week? There's a quiz, there's a discussion uh, forum, and there's these medical language laboratory exercises. So for this week, it's chapter one and chapter two and um, we need to do these exercises. So you have there um, critical listening video and exercises one, two, and three, response exercises one and two, and audio and text generation, okay? Um, practice is uh, uh, optional, but these three things for chapter one and these three things, items here for chapter two, that's what's due next week um before the next class so by 6 p.m next monday uh, i'm gonna look in and um i'm gonna and everything that you do here on moodle and on your medical language laboratory is time stamped so the best bet is is every day you do a little bit every day so that you know you get everything done so that you're not you know at the last minute uh monday afternoon trying to uh, uh catch up and this course, you got to look at it like training. It's a 100 level course. And I, I don't like using the word easy A, but it, it is, it's a straightforward class. Meaning that if you do everything that I'm telling you right now, you should get an A in it. But what's more important is you need to know, because you need to learn uh, uh, medical terminology. Now, anybody here, does uh, anybody here work in the uh, medical field? I do. Yes. Yes, all of you. Uh, I was one a CNA, but not any. Okay. Well, that's okay, right? But but we now know that because uh, those of us who do work in the field that um, if I tell the doctor or the nurse, or if the doctor or the nurse tells me something wrong, what are the odds someone's going to get hurt? It's pretty good, isn't it? And. The reason why we're studying medical terminology, like many of you also are from other, uh, other schools that have anatomy and physiology, it has kind of medical terminology built in, but here at this university, we're, it's very important because the majority of all medical, uh, medical mistakes come from communication and medical terminology, this is the language of medicine. So yeah, you're gonna get an A, we wanna get an A, right? Especially those of us who are, are going into nursing, you want to get the good grades so you can uh, go into the program. But what's more important is that you learn it and you retain it. Because no one's ever going to ask you, you know, a couple of years from now when you're uh, in the ward and you're doing business, oh, what did you get in medical terminology? But they're going to tell you things and they're going to ask you things. And it goes, did you remember all the things that we talked about uh, um, here in this class. So 
quizzes are due every week and you just click here to complete in every module discussion forum we're going to talk about in a minute but the and these medical language laboratory exercises are also due <clears throat> so what are these medical language laboratory exercises where are they and where are is your textbook and it's right here if we go and this is your moodle course shell if you go here um, I have a introduction uh, video here. And also here's all my contact information. And check here in your uh, announcements because they have really neat things in here. Like for example, today, if you uh, click into here, I also added some lecture notes. I could also add some uh, practice quizzes. I could also put the answers to the midterm. I could do a whole bunch of things. But again, my part of my job is to help you train and help you uh, communicate and communication in the medical field. You're constantly checking your emails and you're constantly checking your phone because you want to make sure that you get all the messages. So um, look into these discussion, discussion and announcements. Another thing that I also do is I also uh, put in um, other trainings that are outside of uh, your experience here. And um, especially for uh, those people who aren't, um, you know, um, uh, what do you call that? They're, like if you're looking for a job or looking for some uh, volunteer work, many times I put in messages that I get from um, uh, career services in here. So look at your discussion. Now, right here, down here, where this puzzle piece is, that's your medical language laboratory. And you will notice I'm in Firefox. Um, if you're on Mac, um, um, what do you call that? Uh, the Safari is sometimes glitchy. And if you're on PC, the Internet Explorer isn't the best um, uh, internet uh, platform to use. So uh, use like Google Chrome and, um, and uh, stuff like Google Chrome and Firefox uh, if you wanna log into your medical language laboratory. So you could see here, I'm logged in. And if I just wanna look at my book, I click on, uh, um, I can click on uh, this thing right here. That's your ebook. But I wanna, um, goes, I wanna uh, jump right in into this class. And you could see this is our class. MED 1204NAX. Now, if I go into it and I pretend I'm a student, let me see if I can uh, um, uh, look at it from uh, the student's point of view. View. Not grade book. Okay. So I can view all the modules. And I mentioned earlier that um, we're doing chapter one and chapter two. So introduction to program learning, that's chapter one, and body structure, body structure is chapter two. So once you're in here, you can look at your assignments, right? And you can click on the details, and then you can see here, you could read your textbook, you can click on that. Let's say you missed my um, lecture or you don't like my lecture too much. That's okay. You can hear, well, you have to be at my lecture or at least check in. But you can watch uh, previewed content that um, there are um, actual videos. Let's see here. You can see here actual videos of the chapter uh, lecture. So you could do that. But the three things that have to be uh, the three sections for each chapter and every week is a chapter. I think this week is the only week that has two chapters, but every week it's pretty much a chapter. So if I clicked on this critical listening, let's look at this and let's look at this together. You listen to the track and let's listen to it together. Hi, Deborah. Last time we saw you was for a post-operative follow-up visit. Post-operative? Oh, yeah. That was after my appendectomy a couple of years ago. Right. Have you had any health concerns since your last visit? Yes, I do. I've had some unexplained weight gain, about 25 pounds. 
and I feel tired and achy a lot of the time. I read a magazine article about thyroid problems. I think I have several of those symptoms. Do you think it's a good idea to check my thyroid? Certainly. We'll order some blood work to check your thyroid. We'll also check your blood to rule out anemia. What did you find out, Dr. Peterson? Do you have a diagnosis? Well, Deborah, your test results do indicate hypothyroidism. I knew it. Will I need a thyroidectomy? Oh, no, you don't need surgery. We'll start you on some medication and have you back in for regular checkups to monitor your thyroid levels. You should be feeling better soon. Okay. So right off the bat, right, it gives you like, a, you know, like in the real world, you listen to the story, which is the history, right? You can also see that there's also, there's a diagnosis in there. There's also management, which are the plans. Um, so we're going to be talking uh, uh, more about this, but if you read the chapter, you'd know that there's certain words. So let's, uh, now that we heard this, let's go to a question. So in this scenario, post-operative refers to what? So even though you hadn't, haven't had anything, right? The way to tackle a multiple choice uh, uh, question is you look at what you want. So what do we want? We want to know what this word means, post-operative. Yeah. So, yes. So that would be after the surgery. Yeah. So after the surgery. So let's check with, because after the patient's thyroidectomy. Now, did the patient have a thyroidectomy? No. 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 Right? Now, after the patient's appendectomy, did the patient have an appendectomy? Yes. Yes. He goes, uh, okay. Right? And he goes, now, before the patient's surgery? No. no, because post means after. So the process of closing an incision with sutures. So that we didn't hear anything about sutures. So we can eliminate this one and this one, right? So what are the only two? After the patient's thyroidectomy or after the patient's appendectomy? So she didn't have a thyroidectomy, but she did have an appendectomy. So I click on that, right? And then I go down to the next question. So we look at the word. She might have some anemia because of the blood work. So, and, and we're going to talk about the parts because we have to go through uh, each one. Which one doesn't mean, I uh, guess, without or, and if you read the chapter, right, it'd be what, and. But you guys get, the, get it, right? Now, yeah. the point is, is that you just go through all of them, whether they're right or wrong. It, it goes, I see, the, I see the grade here that you guys have. And then at the end of the week, I look into it. And if you, it, I look at it like pass fail. Like if you did it, you're going to get full credit. If you didn't do it, right, you get zero. Okay. So that you are not focusing on, oh, what grade do I have to have? You're focusing on, did you go through the process? Okay. So, and of course, you should watch the videos or listen to my lecture first uh, and before, um, before you do these. Um, um, these exercises, or if you're already in the business and you've already kind of know what this stuff is, you can, you can go through it yourself. So that's all right. So you go through exercise one, exercise two, exercise three, and there are only like three or four questions. So that's quick. Then response. It's like the same thing. You listen to the thing and then you go through the questions and the question would be like, Oh, how would you answer? Or what, how, like, uh, uh, what would the patient say, or what would the uh, what would you say to the patient, or what would you say to the doctor? And that's what response is, and it's based on the the questions. And then, last but not least, like audio generation, like if uh, you should have a microphone because you know most modern uh, laptops are built with one, right? Um, you go, you have the question, and then you just uh, record and record your answer. Okay. Now, if it doesn't really work out, the audio generation. You know, uh, don't wig out. Sometimes it works out. Sometimes it doesn't. Right. But again, as long as I see that you went through it and then you tried it. And then last but not least, text generation. You just uh, type in uh, the answers to the question. So what are the three rules of building medical terms? And then once we. Hold up, let me just close my door.
Okay. So text generation is like, they ask you like, you know, it's like kind of like word building. So if we want to build a word, you type in the word here. So you could see how, you know, it, it, it goes through a nice little plan and then practice, of course, you know, you could do, uh, you know, uh, more things, but the, but, but the main ones, the ones that are due is you definitely have to do critical listening, all the extra three sec exercises, you have to do the response and the generation. And um, if you have some issues with your medical language laboratory, uh, give me a call and then we could go do a Zoom and uh, uh, we can make an appointment to do a Zoom and then we could do it together for the first time so that, uh, you know, uh, you can, so we can get all the bugs out of the way. Now, every once in a while you do it and it, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't register as anything complete. This is what I want you to do. Like after, you, like, like, let's say for example, you, you, you did uh, one section, right? Um, take a screenshot of it. And um, you can press control and print screen on a PC or shift command four for a Mac. And you could take a picture of your screen. Okay, and then, um, and then you email that to me and you go, hey, Dr. Grise, I did it. I don't know why you gave me a zero. So always check your grades as well. Um, so that, because sometimes like for out of 10 students, there's always like at least one that they did it and their grades aren't logging in for whatever reason, right? Okay, and that's for, of course, what's due for next week is the critical listening response and generation for chapter one, which is introdu introduction to program learning and medical word building and um, body structure which is uh, the second chapter. Now this evening, because we, ha we have that um, uh, lecture with Miss DeLeon at 6.30, I will put videos, and again, back to, let's go back to this, right? Because I don't wanna keep you here all night. You guys got work to do. Um, I could put like, let's say for example, like you missed tonight, I recorded everything. So uh, later on uh, this evening in your, um, uh, announcements, there's going to be a recording of this evening's events. And also I will put another recording for chapter uh, for chapter two, body structures, which is a pre-recorded lecture that I did a couple of terms ago. So does anyone have any questions on uh, what's due for next week and how to do it? Are we good? Yes, I do. Okay, what's your question? Um, my question is where to find the exercises um, at the module. Okay, so let's go back it again, right? So the module here tells me what exercises I should do, which is almost always critical listening video exercises one, two, and three, response exercises one and two, and audio and text generation, all right? And for this week, it's for chapter one and chapter two, okay? Then you click on this and it goes back to your first page. And then you go right here to medical language laboratory. And yours looks will look a little bit different. You click on the class, you know, like, uh, like this class and make sure it's MED 1204NAX, Alexandria campus, right? And then once you click into it, you go into modules and uh, you could uh, go into your assignments and it'll bring you here, okay? Okay. Can I answer your question? And yeah. try it out, right? Try it out right after this class. And um, I'll, I'll be, I'll be uh, um, uh, monitoring uh, my phone and, and looking at my stuff online. And again, I, uh, um, if you saw my introduction video, uh, again, this phone right here is a business phone. So if you call me at 2 a.m., I pick up. Now, if it goes, um, if it's after office hours, text me and make sure you have your full name and what class you're talking about. Because this is what I always get. Sometime around 11.30 p.m. on any a random day, I get this. Dr. Grice, I'm in so much trouble. Can you help me? And that's all I get. So I need your name. I'm teaching five uh, courses this term. I need your name, 
uh, your full name, uh, what course is in question, and uh, how can I help you? And um, if I'm up and you're up, um, hey, uh, I've done tutoring like at 11, 11 o'clock at night. But again, um, let's try to keep things during business hours, <clears throat> uh, which is um, uh, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. But you can text me at any time, email at me anytime, and I answer within 12 to 24 hours, even on the weekends. Because again, communication is key and it's important and be the same way with your other professors. Um, if you're not gonna make it to class, make sure that uh, you inform uh, uh, your professor. So, because right now, I think there's, there's three or four of you missing. I now have to go call you guys uh, or, or find out where you are, okay? And, um, and call early, call, call often. It's amazing how right now, this week one, week two, I'll probably never get any calls. But week nine, right before finals, I get every call in the free universe. Uh, everyone keeps on calling, oh, help, help me with my grades. Remember, everything is what, 10% every week. Now, what's gonna happen in week five? Week five, we're gonna have an online exam. The online exam will be cumulative. It means everything that went down in week one, two, three, and four, will be on a 50 item multiple choice examination that will be online. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in week four. Now week 10, all the way at the end, that will be an on-campus 50 item multiple choice examination. Um, and it's gonna be done like the NCLEX, uh, very NCLEX style. Around week eight, week nine, I'm going to put in announcements, um, uh, last term's exam, so that you guys know um, uh, how that looks like. But starting on week five, uh, way before your final exam, and your final exam is cumulative. It's any chapter that we talked about from day one. So, um, but uh, you'll see what we're gonna be focusing on um, uh, after week five. So again, it's 10 weeks, every week is 10%. Week five and week 10, there's an exam, okay? Now, uh, I believe there is um, two Mondays where there are um, holidays. I believe one of them is Memorial Day and the other one is, I forgot, I, I think it's part of the July 4th weekend. Again, look at your announcements for alternative um, lecture days. And if you can't make the alternative lecture days because you know, you're on holiday or something, please, Give it, get a call or get a call to me. I can give you an alternative assignment or you can do your assignments early so you won't be marked absent. Um, so right now, because everybody on this call, right? Uh, uh, Miss Patience, Miss Jessica, Miss Ibran, Miss Zanebe, and Miss uh, Megmayane, because you guys are here, okay? Uh, you get, um, you get uh, credit, but these missing people, right? Do not get credit. Okay, uh, for, for being here. And week eight, week nine, week 10, again, that'll be on campus. I will announce those dates here in announcements. So if you can't make it, give me a call. And the neat thing about week eight, week nine, week 10 is, um, even though I'm lecturing on campus, I, I guess I also uh, record the sessions so that um, like, let's say you missed it or you, um, uh, let's also say you have high risk members of your family at home uh, and you don't feel you're not vaccinated yet and you don't feel uh, uh, safe to come on campus, please, again, give me a call, shoot me an email, let's talk about it. And then I, um, I'm very flexible because I do understand many people have high risk uh, family members. Uh, some of you are in high risk professions, but you know what, gang? We're healthcare. You're always going to be in danger. If it's not if it's not COVID, it's going to be in some. It's going to be something else. Um, and uh, but again, back to keep me informed and look out for those dates. I'll probably be posting those dates um, uh, probably during this week, um, uh, so that you'll be fully aware of it. And who's calling me right now? So you can see, ding, ding, ding. Okay, someone's uh, uh, 
having trouble getting in. Let's help her out. Let me look at the Zoom. Let's see the Zoom invitation. That is a cute picture. Yeah, it's one of my babies. I got that's another thing you'll find out about me. I got way too many damn kids. Uh, let me see. Hide, floating, hide. Da, 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 da. Oh, very arrogant of me. I thought maybe you were saying my my uh, my Pioneer SX3 is really cute because it is. If you look at it, lovely buttons, magic. Uh, let me find, where's the, the invitation when you want to invite somebody? Chat, security, or maybe it's in this thing. Uh, let's join, back to meeting, schedule here, meetings. Uh, okay, that's weird. That's Let's take a picture of this so we can help out our students having some uh, trouble getting in. Okay. Second, everybody. Okay. Now let's go. Another thing. And look, this person, I have evidence that this person's trying to get in. She's having some technical difficulties, right? Right? So. That person's gonna get credit. She tried. Now I go. Now at least I I know she's trying uh, trying to call me and trying to do something, right? So let's now look at get my silly little boy off the screen. How many of you have children? Um, I, I do. Have have children. Ugh, aren't they the worst? <laughs> the worst. I wish I could go back in time. Just be single and just. Live a free life and go to dinner every night. And <laughs> they are are out. This is not even my youngest. He's now what uh, three? My youngest is one. Oh wow! Oh, I have oh. six children, and my oldest is twenty-three. Oh, oh wow! So I will be going to like high school functions and and stuff like that. I will be seventy-nine years old when, oh, I, really? when, I, when I kick the last kid out of here. <laughs> so that's why I'm. I'm all joking aside. I love, uh, I, I, I love kids to death, but, uh, they, those of you who are parents, they are a chore. <laughs> all right. It is at this point. Um, Ms. DeLeon is here. Welcome Ms. DeLeon. I'm going to allow, uh, you to share screen and I'm going to, I don't know how to do this. Ms. DeLeon, I think, uh, I think it's capable of you sharing now. I think. Let me check. Hi, everyone. How's everyone tonight? Well, are you? I'm good. And Dr. Garias, you may have a student um, trying to get in. Yeah, she... I got. I, yeah, I got her on uh, text. Uh, Perfect. So I'm gonna. I'm. I'm gonna. Uh, 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 get her a link. Okay. Yep. Perfect. All righty. Okay. So let me do this. Let me see if I can get my, sh oh, perfect. Okay. Share screen. So let me, okay. So, uh, so I am Laura De Leon. I am the university librarian. Um, I work out of the Woodbridge campus, but I'm also on the Alexandria campus on Wednesdays. So, you know, if anybody has any questions, feel free to drop in or email me, whatever. I'm, I'm always happy to help. So um, tonight we are talking about plagiarism. And I have got a, hold on a second. I think we've got a chat message. Ooh, let's see. Yes. Um, yeah, Dr. I, and I'm also going to send you tomorrow morning um, a link, uh, well, 
I'm going to send you a couple of different things, which I'll talk about, but you'll also get a copy of the PowerPoint. So, um, but we are going to talk, go ahead. So we are going to talk about um, plagiarism tonight. And let me go ahead and begin the slideshow. Let's see if we can get this going. Can you guys see this okay? Yes. Okay, good. Um, yes. Okay, so. When we talk about, well, before we actually talk about plagiarism, I know that Dr. Garias is going to have you guys doing discussion forums, okay? And in your discussion forums, you will probably be looking for resources, um, you know, maybe on the internet, maybe through the library databases, uh, but there's some things you want to think about when you're looking for your resources. Um, certainly, the you know the library, the the uh, Stratford Library, uh, has all kinds of resources available to you. Okay, um, and they're very easy to get to if you click on library in the Moodle menu, and then you click on how to access the research databases. We have encyclopedias. We have journal articles. Um, we've got newspapers, we've got academic ebooks. So all of that can be very useful for you um, when you're doing your discussions, you know, and you're looking for information um, to use in your discussions. Now, one of the things that you want to make sure that you stay away from is Wikipedia. Um, can anybody tell me why you'd want to stay away from Wikipedia? Anything? How many of you used Wikipedia before? I'm going to raise my hand because I've used it before. I've never used it, but I know that we're not supposed to use it because I think that their information isn't sometimes correct. Right. Right. And that's exactly it. Um, the, the, the problem with Wikipedia is that... Um, Anybody can update those articles. Now, they may be changing that, but allowing anybody to update the articles means there's not a lot of quality control with the articles that are on Wikipedia. So anybody could update an article with anything, whether it's true or false. So, you know, you never want to use Wikipedia as a resource for any paper, any discussion, any presentation that you write for Stratford, okay? Um, you have enough tools out there um, on the websites as well as through the library databases um, that will give you good, reliable information. So I, you know, you're gonna wanna stay away from uh, Wikipedia. So <clears throat> once you find the information that you need, you know, you're going to use, you may be using that information in your discussion, okay? But the one thing you have to do when you use that information is you have to avoid plagiarism, okay? So anybody, can you, anybody tell me, what do you think plagiarism is? Uh, quoting someone without giving uh, credit to the person. Okay, that's part of it. Are you doing his work? That, yep, yep. <clears throat> so the, the general definition of plagiarism is when you, you know, you look at your source information and you use it in your paper, whether it's the author's idea, whether it's a quote that's word for word, whether it's a picture or a graph, and you put it in your paper, but you don't give credit to your source. Okay, to that author. That's considered plagiarism because what that does is it makes it, if you don't give credit, it makes it look like you're the one who wrote that information. <clears throat> so you want to make sure you avoid plagiarism. Um, there's actually two types of plagiarism. The first kind is intentional, and this will make sense to you. You know, it's like cheating and falsification. It's if you, um, you know, had somebody else write a paper for you, or you turned in somebody else's paper, you know, as your own, or maybe you've purchased a paper out on the internet. Those things are very intentional, you know, exactly what you're doing. Um, in some cases, 
you know, say for example, Dr. Garayas tells you that he wants you to find five sources. Okay, and maybe you can only find three. And so what you do is you make up two of them. That's actually considered plagiarism. Uh, the one thing, oh well, and of course, copying and pasting directly from your source without giving credit is plagiarism. <clears throat> the one thing that may be kind of odd, and you may say to yourself, well, why is this plagiarism? Is if you recycle a paper. So for example, you write a paper in one class and then a couple of terms later, you use it in another class, the very same paper. That's actually considered plagiarism. And you're like, well, I wrote the paper. How can I plagiarize myself? Well, the thought process behind it is the fact that, you know, you wrote that paper for a very specific reason in one class. And, and your first class had as its own goals and outcome and is teaching you certain things. When you get to your other class, that has an entirely different set of goals and outcomes. And, you know, it's teaching you other other concepts and other ideas. So <clears throat> by just, you know, redoing and recycling a paper, you're not learning anything new. So you never want to do that. You always want to start fresh with your research so that you make sure that you're learning all the concepts and things that you need to learn in that other class. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me, unintentional plagiarism. Now, this is a little more difficult because in the end, it's something you don't mean to do, but it actually happens. So that happens when you do forget to cite a source. You know, maybe you copied and pasted something in the paper and you forgot to put what we call an in-text citation in, or you forget to put quote marks around something that you took word for word from your source. That's, you know, you may forget. Um, or when you paraphrase something, you know, maybe you don't paraphrase it well enough to be able to, for it not to be plagiarism, okay? And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, but in the end, even if you forget to do this and it was unintentional, you didn't mean to, it's still plagiarism and it's still against the honor code at Stratford University. So you have to be very careful in how you use your source information. Now, <clears throat> how do you avoid plagiarism? Well, there's several different ways. And I forgot to put this in here, but the first one is to make sure you um, is to make sure you take really, really good notes so that you know where your information is coming from. Okay. Um, anytime you take any information from your source material, your, you know, whether it's a figure whether it is a graphic, whether it's a picture, whether it's words, whether it's an idea, you need to make sure that you put in an in-text citation and a corresponding reference. Um, if you're directly quoting on, you know, another author's works or your source material, you always want to make sure that you're putting quote marks around the words that came directly from the source. And again, when you're paraphrasing, you're, you're looking really carefully at what, you're, um, at what you're reading and really understanding it and then turning around and putting it into your own words. You're not just changing a word here or there. And finally, you know, when you're summarizing things, again, you want to make sure that you're paraphrasing it enough so as to avoid plagiarism. Okay, so let's talk about common knowledge. Common knowledge um, tends to be facts that are so well known that they, you know, you can put them in a paper without it being considered plagiarism. Okay, so, you know, the first example, George Washington was born on February 22nd, 1732. You can find that in multiple, multiple, multiple sources. And because it's such common knowledge, <clears throat> you don't have to cite a source. Or the second example, February 2nd is Groundhog's Day. Okay, again, 
that's commonly known. You could find that information in multiple sources and um, be able to, you know, use it without being without having to cite the source. And the third example, the Beatles, the singing group, the Beatles are a well-known singing group, you know, <clears throat> and the four naming the four Beatles is, you know, in your paper, if you were using that information in your paper, you wouldn't, again, have to cite a source because you could find that information in a lot of different websites, encyclopedias, journal articles, things like that. So because it's common knowledge, you know, again, you don't have to cite your source. So that, <clears throat> you could put that aside. So you know common knowledge, you don't have to cite your sources. But it's the other things that you have to cite your sources for. So uh, maybe you're looking at a study and there's statistics. You always have to cite a source when there's statistics, okay? So <clears throat> let's talk about when you're looking at the information, how you're going to use it in your paper. You're usually either going to paraphrase it or you're going to quote it. So let's take a look at that. So paraphrasing, again, is pretty much taking the information from your source and putting it into your own words, okay? And, and one way to try to do this is, like I said, really study what you're reading and then turn around and talk to somebody about it. And you know, your own words, what you just read, okay? So <clears throat> when you do that, that helps you put it into your own words, okay? And, and what it does then when you write it in your own words, you let the person reading it, like your instructor, know that you understand what you just read, okay? If you just do quote after quote after quote, or if you put, you know, something in your paper where you just change a word here and change a word there, you know, that really doesn't tell, you know, your instructor that you're understanding the material because it's easy enough to change a word here or there. It's easy enough to continually quote something, but you really have no, your instructor really has no idea as to whether or not you understand it. Okay. So when you're paraphrasing some things to do, you know, along with putting it in your own words is change up how the sentence structure is. So if you're, you're trying to paraphrase, you know, like a paragraph or something like that in your source, maybe you start with the information at the end of the paragraph, put it into your own words, and then use the information at the beginning of the paragraph and put it into your own words. So that kind of changes, changes around the structure of the paragraph of the sentence. But in the end, even if, you know, even if you're paraphrasing, okay, putting it into your own words, the idea still came from your source material. So you have to provide in-text citations along with references. So if you notice this picture that I've got here of the two cows, I took that from the internet. And so I'm providing a short in-text citation for it. <coughs> So next week when we talk about APA, we're going to get into, you know, what are in-text citations, how they're used in the whole bit. But this kind of gives you an idea of what something like that would look like. Okay, so next is quoting. Okay, we talked a little bit about quoting. When you quote, you are taking it word for word from your source and you're putting quote marks around it. Okay. You, um, you again, you're using in-text citations, so you give credit to the source. Um, you want to make sure that you're quoting exactly as it appears, okay, in, the, um, in your original source material. So if you're reading a journal article and there's something that you need to quote word for word, make sure you do it exactly as it appears. Can't tell you how many times I've seen, you know, students do quotes, but then they drop a word here or add a word there. That's not how it's supposed to be. It's exactly as it appears, 
Okay. Um, let's see. You want to make sure you're only using a couple of quotes throughout your paper. Um, so like two or three at the most. Because <clears throat> in the end, like I said, if you're continually quoting things, then your reader hasn't doesn't really know if you understand what you read or what you've read from your source material. Okay. Now, things like definitions, they tend to lend themselves really nicely to using quotes. Okay. Because, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult to change, you know, to paraphrase a definition. So that's usually a good place to use a quote. Now, there also is a rule that if, if what you want to quote word for word is more than 40 words, that you turn around and indent the entire quote um, a half an inch in your paper. Okay, so those are some things to think about when you're quoting. So let me ask you, do you have any questions about paraphrasing and quoting or common knowledge? Okay, well then let's do a couple of exercises. <clears throat> and let's look at this, this first exercise. On the left-hand side here, this is the passage that came, this is from the source material, okay? Um, in Cambodia, 99% of the revenue from user fees is retained at the facility level to pay staff incentives and to supplement the insufficient and late disbursement of government funds, thus creating staff motivation and ownership and allowing flexible facility management. This is what this author down here wrote, okay? So a student wanted to use this information in their paper. So this is what the student wrote. And they paraphrased and they said, money from user fees is kept at the facility to pay staff incentives. Money is also used to supplement government funds that are late. So <clears throat> what do you all think? Do you think that this is paraphrased well enough to avoid plagiarism? You guys with me? Yes. Yes, we are. Okay, so what do you think? Do you think it's good enough to avoid plagiarism? Yes. Okay. Well, actually in this case, it's not. Okay, and here, here's why. Okay, it sounds way too much like the original passage. And the sentence structure is too similar to the original passage. So if you look, <clears throat> if you look at the original passage over here, uh, money from user fees is kept at the facility to pay staff incentives. So um, this one says that user fees, you know, is retained at the facility level to pay staff incentives. That's really, really close to the original, okay? Money is also used to supplement um, <clears throat> government funds that are late. And in this case, it says, you, that's what the student wrote. And from here, um, to supplement insufficient and late disbursement of government funds. So they kind of just turn the words around a little bit. So in the end, this is, this is not good enough to avoid plagiarism. So let's look at the next passage, okay? Here is what was written on um, a PBS website about Annie Oakley. <clears throat> so Annie Oakley's life spanned years of tremendous change for American women. By the time of her death in 1926, Americans were celebrating the liberated, urban-focused mo modern times of the jazz age. Women had won the right to vote, wore less restrictive clothes, and followed a changing ideal that was loosening some of the restrictions on women's roles and behaviors that had reigned throughout the 19th century. Okay, so this is the original writing. This is what the student wrote. They wrote, Annie Oakley's life spanned years of significant change for American women. By the time she died in 1926, women had the vote, wore looser clothing, and embraced the freedom from restrictive 19th century, century 
roles and ideas or behaviors, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so what do you think? Do you think this one is good enough to avoid plagiarism? Yeah. Okay, anybody else? Yes, I believe so. Well, no. actually again, this one isn't. And again, it's because of how it's written, okay? Yeah. If you look, you see how it starts out. Annie Oakley's life, life span, span years, years of significant changes. The original passage, Annie's Oakley's life spanned years of tremendous change. The only difference is the word significant and change. I'm sorry, significant and uh, tremendous. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, and then by the time she died in 1926, that one, by the time of her death in 1926, mm -hmm. you see how the words were just changed up a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So let's let, let's take a look at another one. <clears throat> in this case, this is again, the same Annie Oakley passage. Okay. This is what the student wrote for this one. As discussed in the biography on PBS's American Experience webpage, sharp, <coughs> excuse me, sharpshooter Annie Oakley lived through a period of many liberating changes for women from the Victorian era through, era through the first quarter of the 20th century. Examples include voting rights for women, as well as the freedom to wear comfortable and pr practical clothing. So what do you think about this one? Do you think yeah, this? Different. Yeah. 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 You're right. This is much better. So you kind of <laughs> see the difference of, of how this, this, the student one was put together as compared to the original passage. Make it make more sense now. Yes. Yes. Good, 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 good. So yes, you are correct. Um, it, what it's done, what the students done here is they've captured the idea of the passage, but they avoided using all the same words and things like that. So if I was your instructor and I read this, I would know that you understood what was written in the original information or the original site from the original source. Okay. So let's try another one. Let's go back to that Cambodia <clears throat> example. This is the one that said in Cambodia, 99% of the revenue from user fees is retained at the facility level to pay staff incentives and to supplement the insufficient and late disbursement of government funds, thus creating staff motivation and ownership and allowing flexible facility management. Okay, in this case, this is what the student wrote here. Workers are invested more in their jobs when a healthcare institution is able to put the money realized from user fees towards programs that will benefit the staff. What do you think? Do you think that's good enough to be considered or good enough to avoid plagiarism? Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Yes, you guys are correct. Because again, <clears throat> they've captured the idea of what was being said here in the original passage, but it's not the same words. You know, they've turned it around and they've uh, they've captured the idea and put it into their own words without using all those same words here in the original passage. And I, you know, I know that this is not the most intuitive, easiest thing to do, but once you start doing it, it does get a little bit easier. It's it's a mindset and a way of thinking and how to put things in, you know, in, in an order that's going to make it not plagiarism. So in this case, any idea, this is the original passage. Um, I'm sorry. And the student was going to quote it directly. What would the student have to do in this case to make it correct in their paper? Copy the exact same thing, I guess, mm -hmm. and not miss any words or not um, add in any words or take out any words. Right. Um, that's, whoops. I th I'm sorry. I think I hit the, there we go. Yes. Um, oh, I'm sorry. 
Yeah. I'm sorry. This one, <clears throat> this is what the student wrote in this case. I'm sorry, I had the wrong one. So um, what do you think? If you look at this original paragraph and read it and what the student wrote here, do you think this is good enough to avoid plagiarism? Okay, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, you all are correct. And it's because, again, they captured the idea, but they didn't use a lot of the same words or anything. Okay, good, 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 good. So let's talk a little bit about quoting. Okay, when you're quoting word for word. So in this exercise, you've got an original passage. This was actually, this sentence here was what was actually written. Okay, this, what you see down here is what the student wrote. What do you see as issues? Because the student is, is quoting word for word um, because they put quote marks around it. We know it came exactly as it appeared in the article, but what is wrong with what the student did with the quote? Um, I think there's something wrong with um, hasn't been. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. And she she took out a systemic investigate. Well, she has investigation, but she took out systemic. Uh-huh. That's another one. What else do you see? After date, commas missing. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Commas missing. The Can you get a little closer to your microphone? The commas missing. Okay. That's correct. There's one other thing. Um, fatal is capital and her is not i don't know Maybe. no you got that right that's exactly okay. right in the alcohol. original yep in the original passage fetal alcohol spectrum is not capitalized but yep. the student capitalized it so that's exactly right those are the things that um those are the things that have been left out so you know <clears throat> yes it's quoted but it's not quoted correctly and like i said i do see that quite a bit so you always want to be very very careful you know usually if you're copying and pasting things that's not so so bad but if you're retyping something just go back and make sure you've typed it correctly okay now in this case this is what the student wrote and they did a direct quote from this author's article here any idea what's wrong with this <clears throat> So let me, let me show you, go there ahead. No quotation marks. Well, here's the thing. When you have, remember we talked about having more than 40 words, mm -hmm. okay? The, the, <clears throat> the quote has to be indented a half inch, the entire quote from the margin, okay? You don't have to use quote marks when you do that because the fact that's indented that whole half inch tells the reader that it's a specific quote. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. good, good. So um, I just wanted to show you real quick. You remember when I had the picture of the two cows um, when we were paraphrasing and I had that little in-text citation underneath it? This is the full reference. And again, like I said, <clears throat> we will be talking about APA format with in-text citations and references um, in two weeks, I guess it is. So what are your resources for knowing how to do this? Um, we do have what we call an APA resource guide <coughs> that you can access through Moodle um, if you notice, again, that's where the library has a presence. And if you click on the library in the Moodle menu bar, the APA resource guide is, is the very first link there. And we've got a lot of resources in terms of plagiarism and quoting versus paraphrasing and things like that. You can contact the library if you need help 
library at stratford.edu. That will get you to any one of our librarians. Um, we also have our library Zoom room that's available to you. Um, if, you if you're logged into Moodle, on the right-hand side of your Moodle um, screen, you're gonna see a student success block. And the library Zoom link is the second uh, link in that block, okay? And we're available during these times, Monday through Saturday. So feel free to drop in um, if you have library questions, if you need help with something, you know, you're more than welcome to drop in and we're there to help you. You can contact me also. Um, easiest way to get a hold of me is that library at stratford.edu. Um, the first phone, <coughs> I'm sorry, the first phone number is my work phone number. The second phone number is my Google Voice number. So if you can't get a hold of me um, for my work phone number, um, feel free to do the Google Voice number. All righty, let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And let me ask you all, do you have any questions about what we just talked about? No, I don't. No? Anybody else? You're a quiet group tonight. <laughs> You've got a lot of things going on, I know, with Dr. Garayas. So I tell you what, what I will do then is probably tomorrow morning, I will email you um, a copy of the PowerPoint as well as uh, the link to that, <clears throat> that APA resource. Um, I'll also have a link to um, a survey if you want, wouldn't mind filling that out. That'll just take you, um, oh, a minute or so to fill out. That shouldn't take you too, too long. All right, Dr. Grice, was there anything else you wanted me to talk about tonight? Uh, no, it's uh, great, just like last time. And and again, everybody, it's like uh, you you could replay this video and look at her uh, her uh, PowerPoint, and we're gonna put all of that stuff there. Um, this is a skill set. Uh, it may for some of you who haven't been using it, it may seem a little bit overwhelming because there's a lot of rules. But uh, just like everything, if you start using it regularly, um, it, it becomes almost second nature after a while. And that's what we want because um, um, especially those of you coming into nursing, they don't give second chances, whether it is intentional or unintentional plagiarism, the school of nursing sees it as cheating and you don't want to be on that tribunal, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, because it's so far um, I've only been on that, uh, that uh, tribunal or that decision process with only one intentional case. Everybody else is unintentional. They didn't mean it. It's just that they didn't know the rules or they didn't properly use the rules. And um, I, I can tell you uh, right now in school, you get a slap on the hand and you get a warning or a zero for a paper, maybe at worst a zero for the course, but after two offenses and if the, if the academic committee has two offenses, that's already grounds for expulsion. We already removed two students in the last year. It wasn't in nursing, it wasn't in health science. Um, they were in other schools, but it shows you that our process is serious and that you don't, and in, re, in the real world, especially in medical, um, they'll do more than fire you. They're gonna have legal charges against you because you. we all know that all the information that we use in medical, can either hurt or kill somebody. So if we don't properly cite where we got it from, and we need to have these, um, and Ms. DeLeon could, uh, 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 says the same thing that I am, in a world where there's nothing but conjecture, guessing, and blogs, and people's opinion, there is, there's very, very little scientific fact floating around in this world. And it's very concerning to uh, especially healthcare people. So it is our responsibility to, to get that idea to you guys. And also just because somebody says it, like, you know, the great Dr. Fauci and the Department of Health, and just because somebody says it doesn't mean it's true. We have to look and, and we have to check 
And all of us have to be constantly checking. And uh, we caught Dr. Fauci more than once <laughs> because, uh, for a whole bunch. And you don't even have to look at the politics of it. It's just that what? It's, it's science. It changes every second. So something that you talked about <clears throat> like a week ago is probably not real anymore uh, or a year ago or even heck five years is is a thousand years in um in health science okay um, and so thank you very much Ms. de leon of and course. we're here in two weeks yes. um and Kinetta, this will be a lot more clearer to you after we go through um the presentation in a couple of weeks um so you know and and don't forget you have resources to help you and you don't have to use like everything at once I want, I'm one of these people, I use the same three or four techniques over and over and over again, and that keeps me safe for most things. But uh, again, uh, practice your one or two techniques, and then, you know, every discussion, add one more, and then you'll you'll see over time, you're like, oh, because uh, my paper's clean, and I don't ever have to, um, uh, when, when I submit papers, I, I don't even worry because I actually used Ms. DeLeon's PowerPoints just to check my paper. So I don't have to run it through any software or anything. I just, because I am confident that if I followed the rules, I shouldn't get in trouble. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ms. DeLeon. I'm like, this. I'm now going to share my screen and then we're going to talk about the practical application of it right in a discussion. So. All righty. You guys have a great evening. You too, Ms. DeLeon. See you. Thank when you. All righty. Bye-bye. So let's look at the discussion forum and I'm going to pretend to be a student. So I clicked on the discussion, right? Let's say I'm going to do my discussion later tonight. And then uh, have you ever felt that uh, medical professionals lying to you? Everybody, you, uh, especially those of you who work in the field, chime in. Do you ever feel like someone's, you know, you know, trying to pull something over your eyes or trying to say something like, I'm the doctor, just listen to me. <clears throat> or I'm the nurse, just listen to me. We all have that feeling, right? Yes. But yeah. those of us who practice, should we tell the patient everything at every moment? It goes, all, it goes so some of you are going to think yes. Some of you think no. And these are one of the kinds of questions. There is no right or wrong answer. But you goes, you got to find an actual rule or protocol or regulation or something at least 200, 250 words using the seventh edition APA format that um, Ms. DeLeon did. And this is, if you follow this, it's the same exact way that you can do a paper. You can write a book about this one question, but some of you right now, probably, especially those of you who aren't really great at writing, we're like, wow, 250 words, that seems a lot. Well, it shouldn't because when you get to your other classes in nursing, I believe it's 500 to 700 or 550 to 650, depending on your professor. So let's look at how to make a discussion. So um, you guys see my screen, right? Yes, yes. So I'm, I got a blank piece of paper, so I can take my question, right? Uh, I can take my question. And this is what I do even to this day. Um, uh, I'm finishing up my MBA and I write, I don't know, anywhere from 10, 15 pages a week, um, per class. Uh, once you get to graduate school, writing 250 words will take you 15 minutes. It shouldn't take you a long time because of this technique. So I'm going to put it here, right? And let me make it bigger so we all can see it. So when you're looking at any response, you always have some sort of introduction, right? And then you have some sort of body, which is the middle of it. And then so you have some sort of conclusion. Well, in every introduction, don't you have to first do what? Don't you have to define things? And one of the things that you're gonna define is, don't you have an opinion of the question, right? So I could write, yes, I felt that my doctor is lying to me. And yes, I believe my doctor, she should tell me everything. Now, what do I mean by everything? I got to define that. I have an opinion 
And also I have a rationale, the why. That alone is going to get you 100, 150, 200 words already because you have to define what's the problem, what's the situation, then your opinion, then the rationale because how many times the doctor didn't tell me something I should have done and I got sicker, okay? That's my rationale. But do you see that's only one story? That's only my experience. Now, if you get... A, um, a good citation, right? You have evidence, direct evidence. Well, according to the National Institute of Health, don't you think that's better than, well, Nelson says that we should say everything to everybody, right? According to the National Institute of Health, according to the American Medical Association, according to this, that, and the other thing, right? And how about if the evidence is brand new? 2020, 2021. So if I have brand new evidence and is it from a vetted site? And what do I mean by vetted website? And uh, Ms. DeLeon in a couple of weeks, was gonna talk more about where you get these things. Don't get it a blog, Wikipedia. We already know that because that's just what, it's, a, it's someone's opinion. I want a vetted site. And what do we mean by vetted? Vetted means that someone's looking someone looking at it to see if it's BS or not, and they're updating it regularly. So you're looking for things like a .org, a .edu, typically a medical school, or, or a school of nursing, and a .org, like, you know, like, um, uh, like a hospital or a medical facility or a, like the, the college of um, the College of Internal Medicine, which is, um, it's not really a college per se, it's an organization that uh, does all the accreditation regarding all the internists uh, in the free world, right? .org, .edu, or a government agency, .gov, like National Institute of Health, Department of Health, right? CMS, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services. Now you could see how such a simple question, should the patient know everything? I define the problem. I have an opinion of what it is, a rationale of why my opinion means something. Does it make sense? And I found some evidence from a vetted website, one or two of them. And I got it from 2020, 2021. So my conclusion is what? I am right because, or how's this? Many times that when, especially when I do papers and I have such a strong opinion, because I am right, I am sometimes right, because, or I found out I am dead wrong. I am dead wrong, because. So you can see here, isn't this also the way you should write a paper, right? You should write a paper with a distinct beginning, middle, and end, where you define, have your opinion, and your why, in your reasoning, now you have evidence to back you up and the conclusion that, yeah, I think you should follow what I should do. Don't you think this is, I goes, if you do this, this organized, it's powerful. When you write a memo, how's this? I could ask my boss, you know, Dr. Esedebe, I really think I deserve 5% this year, not 3%, not 2%. I deserve a raise. Well, I got to define, right? What do I mean by raise? Uh, how much money do we got? Here's my opinion. Here's the reasoning. Here's all the cool things that I did um, to, to grow my program. Hence, grow revenue. Hence, help my student. All the customer service things that I did. More evidence. I look up, um, I don't know, statistics of other universities in my area. And then the conclusion, I am right because I believe you should give me this much money because, okay? So do you, do you see how it could be used to sway somebody? Um, it also would be used on how to uh, uh, um, get funding. Uh, there's a whole bunch of ways to use this and using, it may seem like busy work, these discussions, but you could see how it's building a skill set. No one's ever gonna ask you, you know, what, what grade did you get in the discussion? But they're gonna ask you, 
hey, can you write something this solid? All right. And uh, just, I guess just as a little note, I got left back in the second grade for what? Because I couldn't read, I couldn't write. Uh, I've been published several times over uh, and it's because I learned this skill set. Right. Uh, everyone, everyone says, like, how many of you say I'm a bad test taker? How many of you have that? Me. Uh, I'm a bad test taker. That's BS. You're a bad preparer. No one taught you how the protocol and what's a protocol. What do I do first? What do I do second? What do I do third? The steps. Right. Think about it, guys, even though some of you who, who are in other universities before us, did anyone ever tell you exactly how to do a discussion like I just did? Did anyone ever tell you uh, how to exactly break down a multiple choice examination? No, they wait until you fail the NCLEX or the T's and then you pay what, two grand for a, uh, uh, for a review course? Don't be that, I, I'm that guy because uh, I failed my boards, um, my USMLE step one when I was in medical school and I was panicking. And I took one of those courses and a lot of what I learned in those courses, I apply here. And that's the trick application. Okay. So does uh, anyone have any questions on, on how to, how to do a discussion? Not oh, to stretch it. Yes, I do. Yeah, shoot. Go ahead. Okay. So about a discussion, um, do we have to reply directly from the question or we would have to do it as, um, you just did. You do it like a separate link. Like for example, like I hit discussion right here. My discussion is here. Uh, mm -hmm. You click on here, right here, where it says add new discussion topic. And then your name will automatically come up. And then uh, uh, whatever you entitled it, discussion or whatever you entitled, it, it'll be there. And then I click on it. Now, eventually I'm gonna ask you to reply to one of your classmates, but for this week, just do the initial response. And then next week we talk about how you reply, uh, how do you reply to your classmates? Um, because uh, just as a quick preview, do you guys ever have like other classes where all they ever do is like, uh, hey, Miss Patience, I think you did a great job. And he goes, I, I learned a lot from what you just said. Doesn't that sound like BS to you, <laughs> right? Miss yeah. Ibran, have, have, you, have anyone ever did that to you? Like, this is a great topic. Yes. <laughs> You guys don't know how stupid that sounds when you're on when you're on this side of the screen being a professor. But what's what's better? What if I said, oh, Miss Yannett, I like what you said. I found evidence that's backing you up. He goes, I think what you said is great. I also found this evidence as well. So now we both have evidence. Now our voice is stronger. Don't you think that's better? Or let's say I don't agree with Miss Yannett, right? Miss Yannett, I don't quite agree with you. I found this other article that's refuting your article. Oh, by the way, my article was made March, 2021. Yours was made 2019, right? Instead of, the, instead of like being mean and going, I win. It's like a nice way of doing what? I'm right. Because no one wants to hear that. I'm better, I'm right. But it's academically, you can show. And eventually when you guys get a uh, move up in your other classes, you can have a back and forth. And from that back and forth, now you can learn what? Not, not just one side, but multiple sides. That's why I can't stand what's going on right now in politics. Like, you know, there's a lot of people like, I don't wanna hear you, I don't wanna listen. You're a Democrat or you're a Republican, I don't wanna listen to you. Why don't you listen? They might have a valid point or two, or they might not, but you'll never know until what? You listen and then do your research. Right, like you guys are, some of you probably will go, hate my politics, but that doesn't matter. What matters is, do we listen like adults? Do we find evidence to either back, our, back each other up? Evidence, actual evidence. But you guys see that on TV. You guys see that in the street or with your family. No one wants to listen to anything. Have you guys ever met an anti-vaxxer? Right, they, 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 they don't know anything about vaccines, but they're like, no, it's the government trying to control me. Like what? What, how? It's a vaccine, it's supposed to make you better. It's supposed to help you. So, so we can all get back into the world. And then there's also the other side, people taking a vaccine blindly without understanding what it does, 
right? Like, uh, so uh, there's 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 two sides, and and uh, what's what's best? Knowing both sides, knowing all sides, and then having an informed opinion. And isn't that our job with our patient to give them the best informed opinion possible? Right. So that's what hopefully this course can also teach you as well. Now, let's jump right in to uh, uh, the lecture. I'm only going to talk for a little while, and I'm going to, uh, because you guys had a lot of things going on tonight. So um, I'm just going to show you how the textbook works. And also, I'll put other videos that you can also watch during the week uh, to enhance uh, you know, your knowledge about uh, medical terminology. So let us, what did I want to do? I want to get right into, let's get right into the first chapter. And then uh, I can read. So you go into chapter one. Now, right here on the left is table of contents, of course. You can go into chapter one. And how many of you uh, don't read very fast? Anybody? You can either say yes or no, just to unmute yourself, yes, no. How many of you are like me, a slow reader? Right? Yes. I'm a slow reader. Um, uh, I'm reading this book on Tecumseh. It's only 280 pages. I've been reading it for six months. But, right, it's interesting to me. Now, how many of you read a textbook and found it amazingly interesting that you couldn't put it down? Anybody? Anybody no. here? How about anyone here have trouble sleeping? Yeah. Um, you have trouble sleeping? Read yeah. your textbook. Just read it from cover to cover. But isn't that what you guys do when you study? Don't you think that's wrong? Like, did you ever like try to read the textbook and then you get three or four pages in and then you fall asleep and then you get angry because you're falling asleep? Again, yeah. back to, mm -hmm. and then you feel stupid. You're like, how can anybody else study? because you're studying wrong. You're trying to memorize and you're trying to, um, I had a student when we were still on the ground, she had 14, um, what do you call that? Um, uh, those uh, highlighter markers. She used to highlight everything. Her book was, uh, she, she had uh, like, a, she bought a physical book and it was wet because it was all highlighting. So what good is that? I also have other students and you could be, and don't laugh if you're one of these students. How about this, the note taker? How many of you are the note taker? You have pages and pages of notes. I'm a note taker. <laughs> How many <laughs> notes? <laughs> Guys, I got 30 notes for the last 30 minutes of you talking. No, don't do that. Uh, I call that person a scribe. You're really good at writing, but we need this stuff where? In my head. So mm -hmm. the way to do this is to make your life, to, to work easier, not harder. Let's look at these objectives. OK, now it's a program learning technique. That means you build the medical term. So there are four elements. There are word parts. So and there are rules, elements, word parts, rules right off the bat. Three out of my eight objectives are talking about word parts. So don't you think in the back of my head, I need to know all the word parts of every word? Yes. Yes. How's that? Oh, if you looked at my notes. Did you see what I did? One of my notes, one of the uh, one of the things there uh, said that you should know surgical types of medical terms, diagnostic types of medical terms, and pathology types of medical terms. If any of you looked at the notes, don't you think I took all the surgical words, put them together, all the diagnostic words, put them together, all the pathologic or disease words, put them together? Hint, hint. What am I doing? Even before I'm starting, I'm organizing the way my brain is going to pick up stuff. And don't you think that's an easier way to study instead of trying to go through each and one of these blue boxes? You'll go insane and you'll just cry. And you're like, Dr. Gray said it was an easy A. It's not, it's so hard. Like, many of you, are, um, especially those of you who work in healthcare, you're, both, you're all type A personalities, very neurotic, very stressed out. I'm telling you, because if you don't know how to control that, you are not going to have a very good time in medical in clinical, because clinical is a very stressful place. You have to learn how to organize things and stay calm during craziness. 
it is, didn't you guys ever wonder, I got an MD, didn't you guys ever wonder why I'm not an MD anymore? Don't you ever wonder like, why does an MD, like he stopped being a doctor after all that training and, and just started teaching class yeah, or doing other things. I got stressed out. Six yeah. years, 365 days a week, 24 seven. And I took everything, what, personally? Everything was dangerous, everything was serious. I can't take everything so serious. So after six years of being a physician, I said, what? Fudge it. I don't want to do it anymore. I hate everybody in the hospital. I hate my patients. I hate this job. And now that I'm gone and I left it, it's been years, I regret it. I miss it because I couldn't do what? Properly organize my time. And I was one of those people who thought, um, and I still think that in a way, it's hard for me to not do this. How many of you are people like don't like going on vacation because you feel that you're not out there making money or you're not out there taking care of your kids or taking care of your family. Yeah. You get very yeah. neurotic, yeah. don't you? Like, man, th th the weekend is double time, a time and a half. I could, I could be doing, I'm one of those people. I'm very type A. On top of my MBA, I have two personal businesses. One of them is also overseas. I have children overseas. I have children here. Uh, my son's in the Marine Corps. And I, I got way too much on my plate. Doesn't that sound just like each and every one of you? Yeah. Yeah. And if you do not know how to handle stress and how to organize things so you, things can be easier, not harder, um, this simple class will get very hard very fast. Um, I Because out of, out of 11, I failed two uh, this last term. This is midterm. And if you fail midterm, what's going to happen when you're in pathology and pharmacology and med surge? Man, they, they're going to have a field day with you. But if you learn the stuff that I'm showing you here, how to organize, how to keep calm in the storm and how to prepare, it'll be better for you. So you can see now, I'm already setting you up, especially look at my notes. They're based on the objectives because before we go on any trip, what you got to do, you got to know where you're going, right? Mm -hmm. So you also got to know prefixes. And what's of course, it's a medical terminology class. I not only have to know the parts, I got to know their meaning. I also got to know which singular, which is plural. Isn't that on my notes too? Yep. Right now, pronouncing the terms and all that stuff. Eh, that's for your medical language lab and also for when you practice. So right off the bat, when I look at this, I could distill this all down to what? Parts and their meanings mm -hmm. and separate it into surgical, diagnostic and pathologic. Okay. So first of all, let's look at the parts. So I go down here, right? You see all this stuff? It may seem important, but now that I have a roadmap, does it seem important now? No, I just need to know the parts. Here you go, word elements. And it's bolded and it's a block in the middle of nowhere, right? So what is it doing? It's telling me what? Hey, this is important. Now for all you note takers, now I take notes. Did I have to write all this other gobbledygook? No. No, but I bet you, you note takers were like, one dash one, test is designed to help you. Learn. I know you note takers because I'm one too. Um, when I was a medical assistant and also during medical school, I type 102 words a minute. So in medical school, I typed in, in year one, I typed everything that came out of everyone's mouth. And then you learn, you don't need to listen to every single thing. You need to do what? Organize. So we need to know word root, combining form, suffix and prefix. So let's look at a typical word. Let's look at a word, cardiology. And that's in my notes, right? And right off the bat, we kind of recognize it because you know maybe I saw it on TV, right? But it's in parts, cardi, O, and logi. So let's look at the parts first. The cardi is the root. That means it's the main idea. O, right, is the combining vowel. Cardi and O, so that is combining vowel and the root, right? Root plus combining vowel equals combining form. Okay, and then of course the thing on the end, logi, that's what? 
thing on the end. It's the suffix, right? This is how I, I, I do stupid things like, how do you remember stuff? You play stupid little games with yourself, right? Like at the end, if you're at the end of the line, you suffer. And that's how I remember it. So any little stupid game that you play, it's not stupid as long as you remember it. And I remember doing medical terminology as a brand new medical assistant. I didn't know anything about anything. And I remember suffix, you suffer because you're at the end. So how's this? Those of you who don't like exams, you prepare for it. You know it's going to be a 50 item multiple choice examination. So, and I told you that parts are going to be important. So do you think I'm going to ask you, what is the part, what is the root part of the uh, medical term, uh, med medical term cardiology? And you'll tell me what? Cardi, right? Uh, what is the combining vowel? And you'll tell me, oh, what's the combining form? Cardi slash O. And what's the suffix of the word cardiology, right? Oh, it's logi. Don't you think I can make this and make it an A, B, C, D? Okay. Right? Now, don't you think you can take every single word that I have on um, that uh, the, the notes I made, which, by the way, encompasses uh, like your first three chapters, first three or four chapters? Don't you think you can make yourself little quizzes and ask yourself, which one's the root? Which one's the combining vowel? And 99.9% .9 of the time, the combining vowel is O. Root plus combining uh, vowel is always the combining form, cardi O. And what's always at the end? Logi, suffix. Now, do I have to read the entire book? No, I just have to look at all the words that are in this chapter and they're all listed at the end of, it goes uh, um, uh, at the end of the chapter. And you can also look at my notes. Don't you think I can, I have to find out uh, where all the roots are, combining vowels are, combining forms and suffix. And there's one more. Um, let me make up a word, uh, endocardiology. Now, if I have something in the beginning before a root, the endo is a prefix. And pre means before. So, in the word endocardiology, I made up that word, right? I don't think there's such word. The prefix or the thing that happens before the main word, that's got to be the what? The prefix. So now you learned root, combining vowel, combining form, suffix, and prefix. Hey, root, combining form, suffix, prefix. Don't I have all the parts? So can I move on with my day? Do I, do I have to go over each and every one of these silly little exercises? No. Start looking at these words. Alcoholic. So as a group, alcoholic, what's ick? Even though we don't know what ick is, that's on the end. So what part is ick? Suffix. 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 And alcohol has got to be the what? Root. Right. And if I ask for the combining form, alcohol slash O or <laughs> alcoholo. Dentist, what's ist? What part? Okay. Dent. The root. Word. Feels silly now, doesn't it? Now you can use it with every single word. Now you could pretty much get half the midterm down and you could probably do it all tonight or all this week. Imagine you do one chapter a night. So that's how professionals, did you ever wonder how doctors, lawyers, um, and also uh, engineers can read thousands of pages a night? It's BS. We don't really read thousands of pages a night. We understand the objectives and the gist, and then we fill in the blanks. And then we understand versus, uh, uh, versus memorize. Don't you guys feel a little bit better about your chances now getting an A? Now, make, right? We learned thyroidectomy today. So, ectomy's got to be what? The suffix. Thyroid's got to be the what? Root. Root. And could that be on the exam? Could this be on the exam? Could this be on the exam? Yeah, sure. Now, let's now go over meaning. Because that was the, the other thing that we needed to know. Now that we know the parts, we now have to know what the meaning of it is. So cardi, of course, what's cardi mean? The heart. Heart, right? Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, logi means study of. So when we look at the word cardiology, when it goes, we have to start from the back 
So study of, correct? And Art. study of what? Art. Now, if I change up um, uh, the suffix, it's no longer study of the heart. It'd be what? Person who studies heart or the heart, right? Yeah. So now also, if you look at my notes, you also know study of heart. Can Now do you know a whole bunch of other studies? Yeah. Pathology, biology, uh, gynecology, right? And they all differ from what? Different roots. And that's what they call uh, um, um, organized learning. Mm -hmm. So now I don't have to teach you any logi. You learn them by yourself. I don't ever have to teach you logist anymore. So the pathologist, that's a different person. Biologist is a different person. Gynecologist is a different person. And then you have the different meanings of the roots. We know that cardi means heart. Patho means disease. Bio means life. Gynec means woman. So a gynecologist studies what? Women. Biologist studies life. Pathologist studies death and disease. Right? Uh, did you guys ever hear that joke? Like, uh, who knows everything but does nothing? Internal medicine. Who knows nothing but does everything? Department of Surgery. Who knows everything but too late? Department of Pathology, right? Because they do the autopsies, yeah. right? Auto means what? Self. They got to look for themselves how you died. When you have an autopsy, it's either medical legal or they died for, we don't know why. So we got to look at it. And again, back to the thing I was talking about, evidence. Uh, right now, I have some very good friends in New York City and in Chicago. And uh, many of them, they're pathologists and they're epidemiologists, and they're telling me the same thing. Everyone's ramping up COVID diagnoses so they can get better uh, Center for Medicaid, Medicare services payouts. So all these numbers that they keep on quoting every night, it's BS. It's a lie, right? And if the more you know, the more you understand, the more you start going, oh my God. And you're going to hear a lot of these uh, conspiracy theory things that come out of my head. Here's another one that's gonna freak you guys out. I am not only a physician, I was a chemist before I became a physician. Uh, can anyone tell me what's inside those testing kits? Hmm? You can try to even look it up. What's inside? What's the, what's, um, 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 uh, what's the formula for the testing kits? The testing kits? Yeah, for COVID. Oh, for COVID. Does anyone know? Bob? I can tell you right now, I'm a chemist, I don't know. So okay. when, when the pandemic started, when people were getting tested, I called my cousin up, he holds up, he uh, holds up a laboratory in a tertiary hospital in uh, Tennessee. You know what he said to me? He goes, hey man, I just, get the, I, goes, I just get the box. He doesn't know either. So I had COVID training a couple of months ago. Guess who uh, was heading it up? Department of Health. And Dr. Fauci and, and all these people from Harvard Medical, They're supposed to be really smart. So I asked the question, guys, can someone tell me if anyone can tell me um, uh, the efficacy rate? Now, efficacy rate is how well does a test actually test what it's supposed to test? It's called validity. You'll learn that all in your statistics, validity and uh, efficacy and all that. No one can give me a real number. That bothered me. I spent $1,000 on that training and, and all the experts, the so-called experts, can't tell any of us. After I said that question, 250 other doctors asked the same question. And we were, not, we were all not given an answer. So how do you know that if you are COVID positive, that you're actually COVID positive? Because you could see some people are COVID positive, they die. Other people are COVID positive, they don't even have the sniffles. So doesn't that bother any of y'all? Yeah. Yeah, and it should, because we're thinking people. Health science, we're thinking people. We want to care for people, but we care for people using evidence. Right? My wife always says, I'm anemic. And every time we take the blood, the blood test, what, what happens? Nothing. But she goes, I feel it. I feel tired. And look at my skin. I have pallor. This is the thing, especially when you get a lot of training. Uh, you start thinking you're sick. How many, how many of you do are, are, are that, are hypochondriacs? 
like uh, because you you read a disease and you're like oh i think i have it uh <laughs> my wife's one of those people so you can look see every time we would say word root suffix don't you think i could stop i could write these down mm -hmm. start asking yourself which one's the word root which one's the suffix and if i want the combining form all i have to do is add a slash o to these and look and then i also learned new words let's say i want to know now when you on your textbook um you could just show the answer and then don't you think you can make your own quizzes yeah of each one of these words yeah dermatology logi dermat so an encephalogram now you know encephal means what brain and who does it neurology oh don't get me started on this thermometer business for covid that makes me nuts there is no there is no there is no clinical data that links fever to any virus. It makes me nuts. And just because you have a fever doesn't mean you have an uh, infection. It could mean a multitude, multitude of things. That's why you have this um, term, F-U-O, fever of unknown origin. It could be cancer. It could be just you nervous. It could be a million things, right? But no, you, you, and oh, by the way, uh, those of you who are ever going into my MED 140 class, we actually go through um, how accurate of all the different types of um, uh, things to take your temperature. That thing that they that thing that they point at your head is not even in the top three. It's the reason why they don't even use that. They well, they shouldn't. I've seen it used. They shouldn't use that in the clinic because it is not it is not efficacious. Meaning there's no efficacy. It doesn't. There is no evidence that states that it works. And that makes me crazy. Things like that makes me nuts. So you can look at all these words, dermatology, where we went over that one. What's another word? See, so do you see how I'm not looking at everything? Yeah. Looking at only the important things. Hey, look at this, gastroenteritis. This is an example of two roots, gaster and enter. Yeah. And itis. Now let me get to itis. Okay. Everybody, anybody, what does itis mean? Inflammation. Okay, what does inflammation mean? Does that mean I'm on fire? No. So what does it mean? So my patient has gastritis. That means they have inflammation or infection of their gaster, which is stomach. And of course, it'll be the part of uh, uh, gastrology or the department of GI medicine will be uh, seeing that patient, right? So my patient has gastritis. What does that mean? Or if they have carditis? What does the itis mean? You said inflammation. So what does inflammation mean? I'm a 10 year old. And I just said, does it mean I catch on fire? No. Some of you work in the field and use these words a lot. And you say these words to the patient and the patient just nods their head. But what does it really mean? If you can explain things to a six year old, hardcore medical things to a six year old and the six year old gets it, then you're a damn good clinician. That's what, and that's, that's actually how they trained us in medical school. Nowadays, medical school, um, the art of, uh, back in the day when my mother was in medical school in the 60s, um, medicine was only one or one and a half years. Now medicine is a four-year course with laboratory, four years of learning how to talk to your patient. And this is one of these things. But we all had a, so, so it's hard, isn't it? Can we all agree? Yeah. Because this is a complicated thing. But didn't we all have a bug bite at one time? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, but you can tell me what's in a bug bite, right? Isn't it red? Yeah. Doesn't it swell up? Yeah. Yeah. And doesn't it like uh, get warm mm -hmm. around that area? And, and uh, it's red, it swells up. Doesn't it itch mm -hmm. or yeah. it hurts? And, you know, if you get a bug bite right on, you know, right on that part of your finger, uh, right on a joint, right? A joint space. Uh, don't you think uh, that area won't work? Mm -hmm. No. So, like, like um, by meaning of, you know, when it gets all swollen, you can't move your finger too much. Mm -hmm. So your finger doesn't work. Can we all agree to that? Yeah. Bug bite? So you, everyone knows what a bug bite is. Now you looked at it in a simple form. So my patient has gastritis. So what do you say to your patient? No, Billy, you're not on fire. Well, it means that your stomach, there's something in there that's making it red 
or fill up with the blood. And then with the blood, it swells up and the blood is also warm. And it could be itchy or painful because it's your body's way of telling you that there's something wrong. And your stomach it goes, uh, has a lot to do with your food. And that's why we're a little bit concerned because when your stomach doesn't work right, you won't be able to eat right. How long did it take me to say that? Seconds. Yeah. How many doctors have you ever heard say these words? Never, right? I know of nobody who, who talks like that. But why do I talk like that? Because years of being a medical assistant, years of being a medical biller, years of being um, uh, EMS, right? I was in, um, I was a EMT Delta uh, in New York City when I was a kid. Not a kid, but you know, 20s, right? So this is how you talk to people. But now you understand what itis really means. And ladies, those of you who are going into nursing, isn't this the five cardinal signs and symptom of inflammation? Red, also known in Latin, rubor. When you swell up, tumor. Right? And tumor doesn't mean, tumor means just what? Swelling up, lump or bump. It doesn't mean cancer. In medical terms, it just means a lump or bump. Warm is calor. Pain, and you know, pain and itch run by the same uh, sensory fibers right? So you, you ever have an itch you can't scratch? It's just as bad as, it's just as much torture as having pain. So uh, that's dolor. And if it doesn't work, functualisea, right? Loss, you can put an O instead of an S here, loss of function. You lost function, it doesn't work. So rubor, like red, I rub it. Two more, it swells up. Calor, calories, right? I'm burning up. Dolor, for those of you uh, who speak Espanol, right? It means pain, right? So now you know exactly what gastritis means. Now you know exactly what dermatitis means. Now you know exactly what card, uh, uh, um, uh, carditis means. So now you, how scary is carditis now? Yeah. It's now very scary. How scary is neuritis now, which is um, inflammation or infection of your nerves or your brain? That's very scary. But how scary is dermatitis? Not that bad. Nah, it's not too bad. Yeah. But gastritis eh, is of concern. But stuff like neuritis, nephritis for your uh, kidneys, right? So we can go on and on and on. And it's in my notes. But now, and this is also in my notes, I now showed you a way that now you can have this in your head for the rest of your life. You know, when, when's the first time this? got into my head 30 years ago and it'll never leave because now I always think of it as bug bite. And that's why I could never, never forget the five cardinal signs and symptoms of inflammation. And it's also now why when my patient has inflammation, I could now fully explain to them like a normal human being, instead of saying, what does the doctor usually say? Well, we're going to have to, you know, we're going to do some steroids and, uh, you know, get your T2 count and blah, 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 blah. And then you just freaking, you ever watch a doctor talk? It just freaks out the patient even more, correct? You guys yeah. work in the real world. You see some of my colleagues, they love, you know, doctors and, and teachers. We love to talk, don't we? Mm -hmm. Nap all day. Look, it's eight o'clock and I'm still going. Tonsillitis. Now we know what tonsillitis really is. Your tonsils are um, uh, part of your immune function in your throat because your throat is a very nasty, your throat and your mouth are very nasty places with lots of bacteria, lots of other things, and it could be easily inflamed. Arthritis, Arthur means joint. So now you know when your mom get, uh, gets arthritis, now you know it's painful, it's red, she can't move her hands too much. So do you now have to memorize all the signs and symptoms for your pathology class? No, because if you understand what the word really means, then the world is your oyster. And I can now go through all of these other things, but I think you guys get the joke, right? Look, you can build the word here, right? Don't you think you can go through this entire thing? Yeah. Oh, which by the way, you could go through the entire thing or didn't uh, I already do it for you in the notes? Yeah. Yeah, I did. But go through the thing just to see if I'm right. And do you see, am I reading every single word? No, I know my objective and I know what I need to get in my head. And now you know the two main questions that I could ask on the midterm. 
What's the word part? And what does the word or the word part mean? Mm -hmm. So in, in theory, I'll see you guys in four weeks, right? But every week we're going to see each other and every week we're going to practice and every week uh, we're going to break things down. And you could see at the very, very end, you see there, they have words. And wasn't this a word with or without? Mm -hmm. So anemia, emia, blood uh, condition, and of no or not. That means there's something missing. If, uh, for example, if my patient has asexual thoughts, doesn't mean they have sexual thoughts. They have what? Without sexual thoughts. Mm -hmm. Sexual, al, pertaining to sex. A was what? Asexual. Those of you who have kids, especially teenagers, wasn't it great when, when they were still like at that age where they were asexual creatures? Remember when they were four? They were like, ew, boys, ew, girls. <laughs> Ugh, when they grow up, they're just so gross. My son's, um, uh, the 20-year-old uh, Marine, he's in love and he's gross. <laughs> he's gross now. Oh, look, how's this? When you guys learn your, uh, learn your different uh, uh, techniques, how many times... I see nurses say, intramuscular, 90 degrees, subcutaneous, 45, intradermal, 15. Why, why are you memorizing it? Know that intramuscular means what? Intra is the prefix means what? It's got to go all the way to the muscle. So it's going to go what? Straight down, straight down, 90 degrees. Sub-Q, it's got to get underneath the skin to the fat area, right? So it's got to go what? 45 degree angle. And intradermal, it's got to be only on the top layer of the skin. So it's going to be 15 degrees or less. But you can see them in the hallway. Intramuscular, 90 degrees, subcutaneous, 45. And then what happens during the exam? Those of you who have uh, a, um, a test anxiety, what do you start doing in the exam? You either black out, right? Mm -hmm. Or you start mixing them up. You start going intradermal, 45, 45, 45 90. I see you guys pre-COVID. I used used to be one of my favorite things, just watching students suffer during the exam because you didn't listen to me, right? Because now, because if you follow, and I'm telling you, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I got now two master's degrees because, and an MD, right? How'd that happen? B minus kid. They used to call me Crazy Eddie in high school. Why do you think I joined the Marine Corps? Because I pretty much did my SATs in crayon, okay? I wasn't that bright, but then when you learn ways to think and learn ways to put things in your head, you get pretty smart. And not only smart, you get to service people. And I, and I think that's the reason why you're here and you can't service your patient if you don't know squat or if you can't properly communicate it. So on that note, I'm going to now um, stop the recording.